Hi, Ranveer. Welcome to our show. Yeah. Hello, Sanjeev. So, Ranveer, today I want to talk to you about 2050 and beyond. You are doing a lot of research in Microsoft. Uh, you are an engineer. You're a problem solver. And maybe I can call you a futurist. Yeah, I, I love thinking about the future and trying to help shape it with partnerships, working with bright people. Yeah. So coming back to 2050 and beyond, what is your take about 2050 and beyond? What, how our life will be? 2050 is way in the future, right? Everything we are talking about is hypothesis. But uh, whatever we say about 2050, it'll be great if we can light it up even before 2050. Right, I'll just talk about 15 years, but it could be, it would, as we know, as people in the business sector, it takes longer than what we expect to actually materialize. So yeah, and about the future of food, if that's one thing we think about, I think the future of food is going to get more personalized. You're going to eat what is best for you. That is, what's best for you is very different from what's good for me. The same food might react very differently in my body versus yours with respect to the energy it provides, with respect to the reactions that it has. But I believe we'll be able to figure it out. That is, based on your gut microbiome, your genetics, your makeup, what's good for you. And once you figure that out, being able to manufacture that food that is best for you, and to get it to you in the right way. I think, and that's all going to be affordable. Like maybe they say the future of food, the best for you is kale, and we can get the right kale for you from the right farm, which has the right- I don't like kale. <laughs> <laughs> I purposely, purposely picked kale, because I then, <laughs> the other, yeah, and then what you can do is you can make the other thing that I think will happen is you'll be able to make kale that tastes sweet, that tastes, the, the, that's, that tastes good for you, that you would love eating. And in addition to all of this, in addition to getting the right food, I think this food will, will become more affordable as well. Right now in the world, there are over 2 billion people who face mal malnutrition, who don't get enough nutrients. We believe, and this is, this is a responsibility of all of us, to help solve that problem, get the right nutrients to everyone in the world. So I believe the future of food. Nutrient, uh, let's talk really the food ecosystem today. So we both know, you know, there is a veg and there is a non-veg, there is a meat product and there are people, in fact, almost 80 to 90% of the world eats meat, right? And we both know that the methane gas is just one aspect of it. Even the wa clean water consumption is another one. And almost 63% of the farming land is utilized for mm -hmm. cattle feed, basically. So there is a huge complexity over there. And we are going to add 3 billion more people, so 10 billion more people. So if we eat the way we are currently eating, this problem is exponentially going to be bigger. So this what's your take on that? Yeah, no, and that's a very important problem. We need to grow more food because, the, the, the growing, the, because of the growing population of the world. We need to give them good, nutritious food. And we have to do all of that without harming the planet. Exactly. And that by itself is an immense challenge. And I think we all need changes. I've previously talked about data-driven agriculture as one way, but we need to make sure that it's not just about the farm. That's an important component to make sure that whatever we grow in the farm is sustainably produced, it's sustainably grown. We are not putting too many chemicals we are, we are being more responsible in how we, how we use the land. That's one critical part of it, that we need to grow the food the right way. In addition to that, we need to make sure that the food is transported the right way. That is, a lot of food we lose because of food waste. Over 40% of the food we produce is wasted. We need to make sure that doesn't happen. So we need to make sure that even the supply chain is tracked. We need to make sure that the food is getting to the right place. That's the second component. And the third component is that we need to manufacture the food. And there, there's a lot of very, very, a lot of innovation happening in food manufacturing and using 
the latest in biotech to synthesize new foods like alt proteins, plant-based meat. There's a lot of very a lot of good innovation happening in that space. So I think, yeah, we uh, at, to answer your question, this is a critical problem. We all we need to grow food. We need to feed the world the right way. Feed them nutritious food, and the way we'll get there is by growing food the right way, transporting food the right way, manufacturing food the right way, and of course, cooking them the right way as well. So let's talk a little bit about, uh, you know, you brought a very important topic. So one thing really fascinate me is we can't just solve all the problems, but with the technology, can we create an alternative source of the food? So uh, you talked about plant-based food. How about alternative, like the lab-grown meat? What is yeah, your lab that? grown meat? Lab grown meat is another. It's a very, uh, it's it's very interesting. It's a it's a scientific marvel if you think of it the way that has been created. The science has been going on for a while, and then there have been companies such as uh, uh, such as Memphis Meat previously, right? Upward Food, and they are the others. There's a lot of innovation happening in this space. Just uh, Just Eats did that as well in in Singapore. There's a lot of innovation happening. Yes, we it is there. Our, uh, I am invested in a company called Clara Food. They have developed a chicken grade uh, uh, yeah. protein product. So there are several companies doing it. But the point yeah. is, uh, do you see that is scalable enough? Or do you see people will adopt it? Uh, will you be willing to eat uh, lab grown meat? This is an interesting question. I think, you know, uh, part, of, part of the question is on adoption. Part of the question is on ethics. I don't want to comment much on the ethics part because you know it's very personal. I think right. uh, everyone, right. some people will be will will willingly accept it. Some people will have the so hesitation. From technological aspect, I'm more interested yeah. in your uh, view on the research aspect, like the quality. Yeah. You talked about uh, personalized nutrient. So will yeah. I'm, a, I'm, I'm bullish on it. Yeah, yeah I'm bullish on it. I've I've eaten. I've tasted it. I think it tastes very authentic. Uh, it nice. tastes like like chicken. Like I've tasted plant based meat, which is also very good. Um, yeah. Like, but it's not the same. Meat. But yeah, this is this tastes much better. The challenges will come in scaling it, yeah. and uh, and you know it doesn't. It's not yet at the point where all meats are covered. Like for example, uh, if you're talking of steak and such, there's still some way to go. But broadly. It, there has been a lot of progress, and this is where you know I'm sure uh, the scientists will figure out how to how to overcome that as well for different types of meat, even for seafood and stuff and things like that. And even similarly, there's a lot of innovation needed even in plant-based meat. That also for vegetarians who who lack proteins. How do, how do you get uh, the these vegetarians the adequate amount of proteins they need for a healthy diet? There, for example, there's another IITN who's doing this work, uh, Monica Bhatia, she's from IIT Delhi. And uh, I, like, as you said, full disclosure, I invested in her company, which is, Hi. again, trying to solve this protein problem. Hi, so she's building through a company, Sela Farms, trying to build high protein wheat flour. So there's innovation happening uh, in different aspects from plant-based meat to cellular meat, a lot of innovation happening in the fermentation space and the scope of that. Is That's the biggest one. Yeah, that will lead to really, really amazing products. So I think overall, because then there are other challenges too. Can you not just make these specialized proteins? Can you make them affordable? Can you get it to the rest of the planet? Can it be used not just to feed the people who are in the middle class and above, but like the 3 billion people who, who also need, like the other 80% of the world actually, who, who can't really afford all the expensive stuff. Can we make it affordable? Then you have to solve the supply chain problem. But I think all of that we will figure out if if these things get adopted. The key question you asked initially: Are people willing to adopt it? If they're willing to adopt it, I think as engineers, as scientists, we'll figure out how to solve the rest of the supply chain, the scalability problems. Let's go back to our original question: 2050 and beyond. So let's talk about uh, our Earth. We have 10 billion people. We have the same amount of land. We don't want to cut any more trees from today onwards to farm. What do you think we should do today? Or where are the opportunities for our uh, friends who are going to listen to this video? What do you see? Yeah, yeah. No, there are multiple things that can be done and that are very, very, uh, uh, that are quite possible. I'll talk about a few, right? 
The first kind of innovation is happening in the genetic space, that there is a lot of work happening with, uh, we call it GMOs, you know, but looking at not just GMOs as is, but also CRISPR. Not, kind of you're not talking about Monsanto now. No, no. Just I'm just talking about the scientists. I'm talking of it in the positive connotation. You know, oh, like, yeah. like people, yeah, like people are looking at these genetic variations that can significantly improve the productivity. That the amount of yield you can get in the same piece of land can be significantly improved. This helps farmers. This helps a lot of people who who like they 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 can afford a lot more of this food if you can if you can grow more in the same amount of land more and more nutritious food. There's a lot of innovation happening in biotech where you can make, for example, high protein, high protein, Eat high protein soybean. Yeah, so you can do this again through genetic modification. So I think a lot of more, there has already been a lot of innovation over the years, but a lot more will happen through, through innovative breeding, through genetics to make better versions of, of the grain of the food that we eat. The second innovation that will happen to get to get us to this future of 2050, where I believe, okay, so before I go there, I just want to preface what my belief is. By 2050, I think we would be feeding a much bigger fraction of the world. Much fewer people would be facing uh, world, the hunger problem or the malnutrition problem. And I believe that farming will have a lesser impact on the world, much lesser impact on the world that it is doing now. In fact, farming can play a role in the solution to the climate problem. But I'll get to that later. I'll start with the, how do we solve the food hunger problem? So number one is genetics. Number two, I think what's gonna happen is around digital agriculture. That is more growers are going to adopt digital techniques. What this means is, one of the benefits of that is going to be an increased adoption of precision agriculture. What we mean by precision agriculture is that if you have a piece of farm, I'll, I won't right now, what many, many farmers do is they'll use the same amount of water throughout the farm, Everybody. same amount of chemicals. Yeah, with precision agriculture, you can do site-specific application. I'll use a much lower fraction of herbicide, of pesticide, of water, of any of the inputs, so that in the same piece of farm, I'll be able to grow more at a lower cost. And I think digital agriculture will help accelerate that. We are doing that with our research. We are, we are still early stage. I think our research, it's, uh, we've shown it for medium to large farms. We need to do more to take it to smallholder farmers. In particular, they're like 500 million plus smallholder farmers worldwide. Farmers who farm less than one hectare. How do they adopt digital agriculture? I think we'll overcome that barrier by 2050. But that's the second key innovation that I think is, is going to happen, first being genetic. Just for a uh, sec here. So what you are saying is uh, there will be a lot more technologies we will be developing around precision farming. That includes uh, how we are going to water the area or plant, microclimate. So there will be a lot of technology okay. we are going to develop around microclimate. Uh, maybe possibly drones will play some roles in that. Robots uh, will play a role, yeah. Big role in that, I'm assuming. Uh, self whatever i don't know autonomous way of uh, surveying the areas uh, right. do you even see that uh, will develop new kind of seed the way you were talking earlier which has more protein uh, what portion of that will drive the yield going forward because technically you can have more calories in the same uh, grams of uh, wheat in a way right. yeah. yeah i think that will happen and that will happen either through new genetic improvements with like the GMO techniques or through very intelligent breeding techniques or CRISPR techniques. I think that will have a role to play as well. That is not only you increase yield, but you increase what the nutrient content exactly. of that product is, right? And I think so that I don't will need happen. to eat so much food. I can eat less and still right. get the nutrient I need to live. Because I'm seeing a lot of focus in growing more and more, but not on really how can we compact food. Right, right. Yeah. And how do you grow good food and how do we grow like what is needed at the right place, right? Yeah. And, you know, regarding precision agriculture, I just wanted to mention the use of drones. People still think of drones as, you know, that thing in the future. It's actually happening right now. There's this farmer that I work very closely with, Andrew Nelson in eastern Washington. He's been deploying a farm beats system and he's seen a lot of improvements. One of the things that Andrew does is what he did over the COVID time when there was a lack of labor. A lot of labor were calling in sick. It was hard for him to go take the tractor everywhere. 
Instead, what he did was he used our system to get the drone image of the entire part, figured out where, for example, chemicals need to be sprayed. He put it on this drone. He bought a $20,000 drone. He would just fly to a region, fly the drone. The drone would spray the chemicals only where it is needed. It's not spraying the entire farm. Just going, it's much faster because oh. otherwise you would have to drive a tractor to that part and the yeah, tractor yeah. would have to go the normal route. This is just much, much faster. And this is happening. And I think uh, there was a recent regulation passed in India, which I think is very, very optimistic, which, which makes me very optimistic of the future of agriculture there, for example, with drones. So that is the second part, right? The third part, I think, is going to be um, around the supply chain, which I think people have, uh, you're going to be reducing food waste through more transparency in the supply chain. I think the supply chain of the future will become much, much more transparent. You will know where your food came from, how it was transported, where it was stored, and all of that. And to make sure that the food is rounded at the right place. Yeah. Because, you know, with food waste, one of the challenges is that in the, de in the developing world, a lot of the food waste happens in the first mile, right? The first mile is when it's harvested from the farm to the time it is shipped out. A lot of wastage happens there. In the developed world, a lot of wastage happens on the last mile, the consumers. We buy a lot or we get to a restaurant, we don't finish our food or it gets to a fridge and we, and we dispose it. And that's, as I said earlier, is 40% of the food that we grow is wasted. Mm -hmm. So I think that will have to be addressed through uh, some of the work, very intelligent, very smart work happening in supply chain. People are talking about blockchain for transparency. Blockchain is only part of the solution. Yeah, that's a small a lot more, Yeah, a lot more visibility needs to be added. But I think that will be addressed by 2050 as well. The, the food supply chain is going to get much, much more transparent. Then another thing I think is happening is uh, more food. I think people are getting more and more aware of the food that they eat. We talked about it with personalized nutrition. And I think part of it is part of it might lead to food being grown closer to you. This will also lead to more sustainable food and, and so on. Like, uh, yeah, like the local economy. Yeah, or oh, vertical farms is another one, hydroponics, where you could be turning your garage into a hydroponic system, or there could be like a warehouse mm -hmm. where you're actually growing tomatoes. Right now, people grow tomatoes and lettuce there. In the future, maybe you'd be growing fruits, maybe you'll be growing other, uh, maybe you'll be growing part of corn, who knows what the future is. And right, vertical farming, I think, is, is promising. Right now, that industry is still having some challenges with respect to scale and with respect to profitability Most especially the energy yeah. Yeah. yeah but i think that people will figure out again by 2050 i think that part will happen and then the the last piece there is around uh, the food manufacturing i think that where the biotech will get significantly more advanced the biotech along with the chemistry behind it how do you manufacture new foods i think that part again there's a lot of innovation happening but i think a lot more will happen where the food that you will eat Will because you know once you uh, once you start customizing the food, this is very interesting. Where food is so much more impact is so much more related to the health industry, to the insurance industry. So I think all of that will come together. That is, food you'll start treating food as preventive medicine. That is, you will start eating food so that you don't fall sick, and food has that impact on you. And that's the, that's what I believe is going to be the future of 2050. It's going to be that, and it's going to be sustainably produced, and it's going to be affordable. That is, that's a key part. We shouldn't leave anyone out. I think one of the, one of the challenges, and this is, I learned more and more of that through my work in digital agriculture, is that we don't want people to be left out. You shouldn't make the digital divide much worse. You need to make sure that whatever you're doing is inclusive. And I think that's going to be even more important by the time we get to 2050. I can't thank you enough, Ranveer, for your time today. I can sit and talk to you about farming for another hour. I think we should do a show just about that and have a podcast around it. Uh, before I let you go, I just want to talk a little bit, uh, you know, you touch upon that. Uh, so I have invested in a, uh, another business uh, in food space, mushrooms. And of course, nutraceutical purposes and all. And I was talking to him and I was amazed. He said that they can even change the taste of mushrooms. So there are ways they can make patentable design to have a kind of a seed for a mushroom. And it's interesting how the mushroom is grows pretty much. It doesn't really need much. You put it in a bag and after a month you come and you get the mushroom. So I'm just wondering, 
will we be having a uh, apple flavored uh, mushroom in 2050 or where are we going with that yeah yeah no and people are manufacturing all sorts of products there are these uh, uh, like a bubble of water right you can eat water and that yeah, 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 yeah. That. that was so funny it was amazing yeah and there's another thing that uh, yeah, we are actually working on, it's early stage still, it's, these are chopsticks, which you can change the taste of what you eat. So imagine you're eating kale, going back to a kale thing, and it tastes like <laughs> it's something sweet or gulab jamun or rasagulla, oh, if you eat that kale. Now, this is all futuristic, right? but who knows? Who knows where the world is headed? But yeah, science is creating marvels, and more of it will impact the food that we eat, all in a good way. I think in the end, Right now, world hunger is such an important problem. The malnutrition is such an important problem. And it's really nice to see scientists across all disciplines coming together to help address that. And I'm very optimistic of the future. Thank you so much for your time today, Ranbir. I really had a lot of fun. Sorry we took a little extra time from you. I can't thank yeah. you enough. And uh, do you have any parting thoughts for our audience? Uh, no, I think this group is an amazing group. I really enjoy and learning about all the work that this group has done, the impact that uh, this, this pan group has made and would love to create partnerships. If people are interested in this, please do reach out. Uh, a lot of what we do is by working with others, partnering with the right people. And this is the smartest group of people would love to work with you to create even more impact. Thank you so much, Ranveer. Thank you, Sanjeev.